A pleasant good morning to everyone. Welcome to this week's edition of the Coles Brown Show right here on the Black College Sports Network. Yours truly, Carlos Brown. Here's the guest menu for April the 13th. Charles Etman, Coach Van Petaway, A.D. Willow Brown, Morgan Williams, and a very special guest in hour number two, uh, Dr. Paula Jackson. What's trending on the Carlos Brown Show? Southern University in baseball loses the series to UAPB last week, coming off a uh, significant win over LSU. The Jaguars drop two of three, lose the series. And when we talked to you last week, they had won the Friday night game 13 to 11. NCAA uh, basketball champions have been decided. University of South Carolina on the women's side, UConn. On the men's side, we'll hear what Coach Petaway has to say. He was there at the Final Four Champions Crown. Uh, Southern University and softball, they get it done last week against UAPB. Also, a no-hitter we're going to tell you about from a Southern University uh, pitcher. And last, number four, what's trending? I got it right this time. Southern University football spring game is today. <laughs> Not last week, as I uh, previously stated, but today at 1 p.m., the Jaguars conclude their spring practice with their spring game. That's what's trending on the Coles Brown show. Now the panel will be with us now. Coach Van Petaway. <laughs> A.D. Willa Brown and uh, Charles Edmund. Charles, I, 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 and guys, I did get it right this time. Spring game today at 1 p.m. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, Wheeler, uh, yeah, ni nice and uh, sunny in Baltimore, or is it cool and crisp? It's cool and crisp. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> well, that's that's Baltimore. I, I, I yes, it is. Know. Yes, it is. No complaint. I understand, Coach Petaway. Yeah, well, it's it's cool here in Huntsville. It was forty four last night. Uh don't like that either. Too cool. <laughs> <laughs> and Charles Edmund, how you doing, sir? I'm doing well, and it's uh, it's nice and uh, it's pretty pretty awesome actually. A little crisp in the morning, but it's it's a good weekend. It was a great night last night for baseball. It's gonna be a good weekend coming up. A nice break considering we had three, four, five inches of rain around here. Um, power outages galore, tornadoes just to the north of me in Vicksburg. Rough, rough weather week, but right now, so far, so good. But yet, we're still here. Yet, still we here. stand. Um, Miranda Rolton, a no-hitter in softball for Southern University. Uh, against Arkansas Pine Bluff. I, I think that's a tremendous feat, a no-hitter, whether it's baseball or softball. She gets it done. Kudos to uh, Southern University softball and Miranda uh, Roden on a uh, no-hitter. But Southern University baseball coming off of uh, just a great win against LSU. Then the next weekend, you have a UAPB and Coach Carlos James team. They came in and they got it done. Last Friday, Southern got the only victory, 13-11. Uh, then they lose 17-8. They give up 24 hits, three errors. And, of course, they lose that ball game. And then the final game, 11-6. It just goes to show you, you have to be ready. And uh, I, I have a simple rule that I got from football coaches from across America. You have a 24-hour rule. After a big victory like that against uh, LSU, you got to put it in the memory banks and get ready. But uh, congratulations, UAPB. They got it done, Charles. They got it done. Yeah, they did. And I think, you know, it kind of started the week prior against us when we went there and they scored like 45 runs in the last two games of that series. So they were 
riding a nice little wave of momentum. They've got some individuals that when you look at the track standings that are near the top in a lot of different categories. And, you know, you got to be happy for Coach James, you know, from his health standpoint, he's, you know, he's coming around. He looks pretty good. His team is playing pretty well right now. And, uh, you know, as far as Southern goes, I don't know what to expect. You know, I, I have to admit, Carlos, you and I have texted. You were right and I was wrong. I thought the coming off the LSU win, that would be a, a season-turning situation. You beat the defending national champs at their ballpark, and I'm like, all right, let's go. Yeah, they went one game, and then they lost two out of three. So it just shows you you got to show up every game. doesn't matter what you've done. And Southern University, up and down, as you indicated, and that's kind of where Southern is. Now we'll see what happens with Alabama State, though. You know, they beat Auburn three to two. Mm-hmm. We'll see what happens with them if they can add to that momentum. But the last two two midweeks, Carlos, SWAC teams getting it done outside of the conference against SEC opponents, and that's a good thing. But I think also that, you know, you got to build on that. And so far, Southern didn't. We'll see what happens going forward. And uh, it's just the yo-yo season for Southern. Coach, Coach Petaway. Yes. You probably, I, I would think you've been in a situation uh, where you come off a big victory and and then you, you try to guard yeah. against having that kind of a, a letdown, um, but you saw what happened. How, how difficult is it from a coaching standpoint to, to, to have your team to kind of move past that in the 24-hour period? A lot of times it's very difficult uh, to get those young young men and women to uh, to remain focused. Uh, you know, they put a lot into probably winning that the big game, and then you overlook that. That's why they always call that next couple of games trap games, uh, because you all your emotions you're so high for that win, uh, the one that you really everybody's really going after, and then you ha- you just have that emotional letdown. And that's going to happen when you got these young young people out there uh, competing, but. Uh, at some point, you have to rally the troops so that they uh, will become refocused. You have to find a way to refocus them because you need to finish the season out and you need to continue uh, on your winning path. Willer? Well, you, you know you're dealing with 18, 19, 20-year-old kids, and uh, you know the, the, the culture kind of ebbs and flows, you know, when it comes to them. You know, they, they really have short memories. Uh, you know, so it, it's not uncommon for them to be up and down like that. I think, I think, you know, all the, all the squads go through that and, uh, you know, probably with a big emotional high coming off of that, that win. And, uh, you know, how do you duplicate that, replicate that night in and night out, you know, but I mean, you know, you don't want these uh games that you should win to come back and bite you in the butt at the end of the day you know mm-hmm. so I, I would venture to say that while the lsu win was important you know the pine bluff game because it's a swack game was probably a little bit more important at the end of the day you know yeah. so you know it's all about you know getting them up keeping them up keeping that foot on their neck and keeping it on a gas pedal, I think. Yeah. I, I, and I think we always talk about consistency in the team that's uh, consistent, get it done night in and night out, day in and day out with the, with the effort. And now um, they were scheduled to play Graham the state who is in first place in the Western division, but yeah. um, because of all of the uh, inclement weather, this uh, past week that the system that, you know, passed through several States. Now they're going to play a doubleheader today and then Sunday they'll finish out this, the, the series. So it is an opportunity for, for them to uh, get back in the swing of things, but it, it, it's going to be tough because if, if you look at it and we talked to uh, um, Morgan Williams in our baseball swag, baseball report, um, we're going to see who he would rank uh, are the top teams in the in the conference. Just, you know, looking at basically what has happened in the conference season so far. But Graham State, 
I, I got to think you, you have them up there, one, two, number one, number two. And I guess it's debatable, but we'll, we'll, we'll see. And uh, we'll see what everyone in the chat room uh, feels about that. But um, it's, a, it's an opportunity for Southern to, to redeem themselves. Uh, but, again, it's going to be tough. Can you win the series? Can you get two out of three? Is it more likely you will win one out of three? And, you know, the, the formula is in baseball, you take care of business at home, and if you can split on the road, uh, you'll put yourself in a position to, uh, to, to, to to get it done. So we will see. see Southern softball, uh, they dropped a 7-2 to decision to Prairie View in game one of that series, and that they were coming off of a, a, a series win against UAPB. So, with that being said, you, you just want to be consistent. Get it done. And uh, uh, and it's interesting that you bring up the points, both of you, Coach Fedaway and, and Wheeler, and, and I haven't agreed with that, that when you're dealing with 18 to 22-year-olds, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a challenge to kind of keep them up, keep them <laughs> keep them focused so i i, I do uh, agree with that um we're gonna take a um time out we'll come back we'll see if we'll have charles back um but after the break we'll get into segment two which will be ncaa basketball coach <laughs> and, I, and i had my <laughs> notes down i had you from, i had you from um winning it all but it was some yeah. interesting tidbits to uh both games but at right. first we'll get into the south carolina and iowa basketball game and then we'll follow that up with uh yukon and uh i mean yukon and purdue to do yeah we'll take a time out you're watching the carlos brown show right here on the black college sports network <coughs> Itchy, squirmy, scratchy, family not getting clean? Get Charmin Ultra Strong. Go get them. It just cleans better. With a diamond weave texture, your family can use less while still getting clean. Goodbye, itchy squirm. Hello, clean bottom. <laughs> <laughs> we all go. Why not enjoy the go with Charmin? At Hampton Law, our primary goal is to provide non-traditional yet effective solutions and redefine the approach to client legal concerns. As your trusted legal advisor, we believe in sophisticated, personalized services that eliminate the confusion and complexity sometimes associated with legal matters. Our high standard for client care and concern, coupled with our extensive legal knowledge and skills, make Hampton Law a resource focused on the protection of the client's interest and overall goals. We value our clients and truly enjoy working with them. Visit thamptonlaw.com to conveniently schedule an appointment online. Tamika Hampton Esquire, 1631 Rock Springs Road, Suite 336, Apopka, Florida, 407-494-1471. thamptonlaw.com. Nope. Nope. You want him? Ooh, I like him. Quick, the quicker picker upper. Bounty picks up messes quicker, and each sheet is two times more absorbent, so you can use less. He's an eight. He's a nine. Bounty, the quicker picker upper. From novice to aficionado, find yourself here. High quality cigars plus personal customer service. Slowburn is Waco's only mobile cigar lounge, featuring a meticulous curated collection of premium cigars. Visit our website, www.slowburnwaco.com. That's www.slowburnwaco.com. When it comes to professional learning, teachers deserve better. From the leader in online learning, Stride brings you the Stride Professional Development Center an on-demand library of mobile-friendly courses that gives teachers choice and flexibility, allowing them to learn anytime and anywhere. Our dynamic courses provide bite-sized learning and help educators advance their knowledge while also gaining professional development hours. It's time you take charge of your learning. Visit us today to get started.
Welcome back to this week's edition of the Coles Brown Show right here on the Black College Sports Network. I uh, want to say greetings, good morning to everyone watching the show on uh, X, YouTube, Facebook, Facebook, of course, on the Black College Sports Network and the Coles Brown Show. Also on uh, Instagram, uh, we appreciate everyone uh, tuning in. Don't forget to hit the like button, thumbs up, uh, notification for both Black College Sports Network, all of our shows on the network and the Colos uh, Brown show. So I want to say a special thanks and hello to everyone on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and X. Coach Petaway? Yes. Okay. The NCAA championships are over with on the women's side and the men's side. On the women's side, congratulations to South Carolina, a 87 to 75 victory over Iowa. 37 bench points to zero by South Carolina. Depth inside proved to be too much for Iowa. Post play. Kaylin Clark, 30 points. But I, I will say this. Uh, Ms. Johnson shut down, or at least did a very good job on Clark. She had 18 points in the first quarter. She finished with 30. But uh, South Carolina, too deep, too big too strong, they get it done. Right, and I think you, you said it from the beginning, the, the biggest the telltale sign, you got 37 points from your bench. Iowa had zero points coming off of their bench. Uh, they tried to play, They Iowa had six players to, to have double digit minutes. So they only played six players against an entire uh, team and South Carolina was just a little too deep for them. And then when you talk about the 30 points for Caitlin, she took 28 shots to get those 30 points now. Mm -hmm. She took 28 shots. And uh, and you're absolutely correct. Now, Raven Johnson, she sacrificed herself for it, for the benefit of the team. Uh, she didn't shoot the ball well because she spent so much energy trying to guard Caitlin, taking, reducing her touches. And then when Caitlin got the ball, she just wanted to make sure that she was taking difficult shots. And that just, you know, that came to fruition. Uh, so my hat's off to Raven Johnson. I, I thought uh, LSU, I mean, uh, I thought South Carolina learned the mistakes from the LSU game when it came to guarding Caitlin Clark. And, and what they did, they put a bigger, more athletic players on her. And then they did not do what they call drop coverage. Well, that, that's the new term for it, drop cover. Mm -hmm. dog on drop cover. They just, nah, they went under the screen. You know, they were going under the screens, and then uh, South, Carolina say, uh, South Carolina said, no, we're not doing that. We're going to hedge. We're going to get up. When Caitlin comes off of a screen, we're going to be there. And that's what they were doing. So they pushed her further away. And then what they also did, they made sure that even if she had a big game with the 30 points, that the other players on the team didn't have big games. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the difference in the game. And then when you look at the re rebounding edge, uh, South Carolina out rebounded them 51 to 29, and 18 of those were on the offensive glass. In fact, two players, Cadosa and Kitts, between those two players, they had 27 rebounds. And as a team, Iowa only had 29. So they were almost out rebounded by just two players. So it was, it was a total dominance, uh, for South Carolina. I, I thought that, uh, Don Stanley, she did an outstanding job, man having her ladies ready, and no matter what what happened. And did you see how cool she was at the first quarter when, when Iowa jumped out to that big lead? Man, she she didn't she didn't bat an eye. She didn't bat an eye. She didn't call a timeout either. She said, y'all got us in this mess. You're going to get us out of it. And so she relied on her team. She believed in the ladies that she coached all year, and they had a great season. They, they capped off their season with an undefeated season. Uh, national championship, you can't ask for anything more. And back to back. Back, yeah. No. No, no, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Not, no, no. LSU won it the year before. Yeah. 
Yeah, two out of three, though. Two out of three. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, maybe mm -hmm. I'm thinking about oh, I'm thinking about UConn uh, on, yeah. the, on the men yeah. on the men's side back to back, uh, but but again, just two and a great coaching, her and the staff. Look, they were the better team. I mean, yeah. you, they check all of the boxes. It you know it's tough. Clark could have scored fifty points, but it was the depth of uh, South Carolina. Tremendous, tremendous job, Charles. Yeah, I mean, they were the best team all year, undefeated, the best coach team, the best dress coach team, all that. I mean, yeah. you know, you, you got to give South Carolina their props and their kudos for staying with it all year long. I mean, I thought that third quarter is when they kind of pulled away. I think Iowa kind of had them a little bit in a tussle, but then they start, South Carolina started knocking down the three ball. And I think that's not what Iowa expected. When you saw what Iowa was trying to do, race down the floor, beat them in transition, South Carolina got back with that too. So I think that third quarter is where South Carolina pulled away. And look, I mean, Clark, she, she is great for college basketball. We'll see what happens at the next level. But uh, it, the ratings were off the charts. The South Carolina was the better team, the better coach, the better dress coach. And, and they're loaded for Bear again. To do it again. I mean, if you, yeah. have, if you see what they have coming back, you know what LSU's losing. You know what Iowa's losing. You know who's to say that South Carolina can't three peak? But what South Carolina had, what they have now, and what they've got coming up would lead you to believe that they're going to be the best team going forward. But congratulations to South Carolina. They were dynamite. That third quarter was terrific, and they were a terrific team all year. And I think uh, Carlos, you know. You you have to give credit to both schools. Both mm -hmm. schools danced with the partner that got them there. You know, so it was just a matter of, you know, who was going to prevail, what will was going to uh, dominate over somebody else's will, that sort of thing. But, you know, both both schools danced with the partner that they brought to the dance. You know, and, you know, it was just a matter of, you know who was going to get it get it done ultimately and uh you know i don't think anybody had any doubt that south carolina was always going to be the deeper squad that sort of thing and uh they just rose to the occasion and 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 got it done you know but it was a business-like type of atmosphere i thought you know you saw the emotions there but you know, you could tell on the girls' faces, you know, this, this is all about business here. You know, we're getting ready to get up in you guys, and, you know, here it is, here it comes. You know, give us your best shot. Let's let's see where we are and uh, and kind of take it from there. But it, it was great. Right. It was a defense. It was a defense. Uh, I, I thought that South Carolina's defense really made a difference in that game. They held Iowa to only 39% shooting. Uh, mm -hmm. from the field, and, and uh, uh, South Carolina shot 47% from the field. And then when, when you look at second chance points, South Carolina had 30 second chance points to, to only 16 for Iowa. They had 48 points in the paint. So, see, they, they just showed their dominance. And and uh, my, my hat's off to those ladies. They, they, did, they played together as a team. You had you had more than, than just four or five players contributing – they, you know, when, when you look at the, the, the final stats, uh, South Carolina had five people in double digits. So, see, they spread mm -hmm. it the wealth. They spread it the basketball around. So, it, 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 was a, it was a great game. And then, you know, Cardoso was named uh, MVP for the, the tournament. With, and in that game, she had 15 points and 17 rebounds. But, but then you got to look at Kit. She was right behind her with 11 points and 10 rebounds. So, uh, they just showed their dominance, man. And they showed – what it, what it is to have a team versus having a superstar player. So, you know, that, you know, if the super, when the superstar player is playing well, you still got to have the others to contribute mm -hmm. to win the basketball game. And that, and that did not happen for Iowa. So you can always have that one great player, but it's a team sport. It's a team game. You got to have the other people contribute. And they didn't have enough of that on, on that particular night. And, and also, uh, to your point, Coach Petaway, like in the previous game with Iowa and LSU, you saw the difference. Of course, LSU women 
their strength were inside, but you know, they didn't hit any mid range shots or outside shots. Um, the freshman for South Carolina, she hit some um, some outside shots. So South Carolina went inside out, but up against Iowa zone, and, and maybe you can elaborate a little bit more. South Carolina were able to hit those open shots against that zone. So they play inside out. Just, just an outstanding game. Yeah, and, but I think the biggest thing to me, the biggest takeaway from the, the LSU game against Iowa, they allow they they allow Caitlin Clark to dominate that game. In other words, they let her get going, and once she got going, they couldn't stop her. They couldn't slow her down. So you don't you don't mm-hmm. let her play. <clears throat> Carlos, at the beginning of that game, I would have been trying to keep the ball out of her hand. Mm-hmm. I would in the beginning of the, of that game against LSU, I would have wanted the other players to step up and beat me and not Caitlin Clark. And, and, and there's no way, there's no way I would have, I would have had that matchup. I, I would have put a bigger person on Caitlin, um, a person that I felt would have uh, harassed her more. Uh, physically, mm-hmm. the point guard from LSU just could not, she was not a challenge for Caitlin no. because Caitlin could shoot over her head because she was too short. Uh, but, but what South Carolina said we're not going to play the, the same way. And they didn't. Mm-hmm. They didn't. There was no drop cover. When there was a drop coverage against them, it was because it was a mistake. Somebody made a mistake. But the next uh, play down the floor, you, you saw them get up and hedge, uh, come across screens, be waiting on her when she came across the screen. And you didn't see that in the LSU game. So, uh, so having an opportunity to watch her play against LSU, I think helped South Carolina staff come up with a game plan. And, and that's what that's what coaching, that's what that's what uh, scouting, that's where that comes into play. And they scouted, they learned from their mistakes, and they said, we're not going to do this. We're not going to make the same mistake. Because I guarantee you, the little freshman mm-hmm. from South Carolina, Full Wilder, mm-hmm. if you had put her on Caitlin, she would have given her a challenge. But mm-hmm. Coach uh, – Don Stanley, she says, no, we're not going that way. We're not going to do that. And that's why they put Johnson on her. That, that they, they wanted to make sure that they had a taller player, a more physical player on her. And, uh, I, I, and it worked. It worked. All you had to do was get physical with her. You saw she got frustrated out there. She got mm-hmm. frustrated. She was taking uh, – Kaylin was taking bad, bad shots. She was only five for 13 from the three. So, so they did their job. Yeah. Well – and that alludes to um, – I was looking at a, a podcast, and they were talking about Clark at the next level in the WNBA. She's going to get a, a, a lot more taste of what she had in that championship game. Right, because there will be bigger guards in the WNBA. they will be more athletic. And mm-hmm. so, some of those guards, they're going to be waiting on that rookie to come in. They're going to be waiting on her. Number one, she's going to be the number one pick. She's going to be the rookie. No one is going to want her to come in and shine against them. So they'll put forth a little more effort when it's time to play her. So she she's going to see a more physical game in the WNBA than she saw. It'll be more like what South Carolina did to her every night in the WNBA. So it looks like, Coach, she will have to make an adjustment to <laughs> – to, to her to her game right and how long you think it will take her to make that adjustment it, it's hard to say I, I probably half a season most of the time it takes rookies about a half a season before they can you know feel uh get their feet on the ground and and find their niche on that level yeah once again good morning to everyone in the chat room uh, we're discussing um the women's uh, NCAA basketball championship. Now we move to the <laughs> men's side. Edie, 37 and 10, but the others did, there's that term again, others did Nine. nothing. You got overproduced 75 to uh, 60. That was just my little quick notes off the top of my head watching, <laughs> watching that game. And UConn, back to back campers got that one right back to back champions and then also you you look at it 
they played the way they practiced. And I think, Coach Pedro, what you alluded to it last, last week, how, you know, when you watch that practice, um, you see UConn do the same things. And, and, and by the way, <laughs> their coach said, I'm not going to Kentucky. <laughs> that's a, a that that's a big opening now because uh, Calipari went to Arkansas. I didn't see that coming, but let me stay on course here. UConn over Purdue seventy five to sixty. Charles double digit wins in every game in the tournament. They were strong. They were dominant the whole tournament and you know when you talk about college basketball today in the blue bloods you talk about the carolinas and the kentuckys and the dukes but who would have solved this dominance from uconn throughout the whole tournament and that's uconn basketball that's hurley and the way he coaches and so did i see that dominance coming no i didn't but they, they get it done on the offensive side. They got a big guy that can get it done and defensively. They can slow you, if not lock you down. So I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised that UConn was going to win the game, but I was surprised at how dominant they were in this game. So it just shows you, you know, this this Big East, uh, East Coast, grind them out, the old school basketball that, that we hadn't seen in a while, that stuff still works in some cases. And for Coach Hurley, who's an old school guy, the yep. old school way of doing business. It just mm-hmm. shows you that maybe sometimes old school, you don't throw it in the trash can quite yet in in this day of college basketball. He proved that at least right now, and that's all we can say, that it, it worked for this season. They were dominant. They were awesome all year. And it just, it you know, it just capped it off with back-to-back titles and a dominance of Purdue. Right. And, Carlos, what this showed to me, has shown to me the last couple of years, Coach Hurley is what we call an old school coach. Mm-hmm. He, he, he gets up in them. Uh, remember, he, he got a tech because his guy was right there in front of his bench and, and didn't get the ball and I mean, didn't start to play in time. So remember, they teched mm-hmm. him because he he pushed his guy to get him going in the play. It shows to me that there are still kids out there that want to be coached. Yeah. And don't mm-hmm. mind being coached. And they play for that guy because he's up in them. He coaches them hard, but they know he loves them. I mean, mm-hmm. and he, he's interested in them. He cares about their future. So as an athletic director, as a coach, when you see that, you let that man, you let that man coach his team. You know, mm-hmm. as, as long as he's not abusing those kids, his style has shown in the last couple of years, or really three now, uh, that the kids like the way he coaches, or else they wouldn't come and play for him. They wouldn't mm-hmm. play as hard. And his method, his method works for him. And that's what I think the biggest thing. Everybody can't coach that way. Players are not going to accept that from everybody. But if they know coming in, this is how you do things, then I think they, they will accept it more and better. I don't mm-hmm. think a kid that cannot take his style of coaching will come and play for Connecticut. So he in the, in the recruiting process, they're getting people that fit their system. They're getting people in there that believe in the team. They're not looking – to go one and done. They're looking, they're looking to stay and build something. And that's how this man has been able to, to win. And when it comes to, I picked UConn to win it all. And I thought that going up against Purdue, Purdue was just like Iowa. They got one player. They got one big star. They rely on that big star. So what do you do? You let him or her get theirs. You cut off the rest of them. And that's what they had because – when you, when you look at this this basketball game, there were only two people in double digits for Purdue, and that was mm-hmm. Edie and our Smith. Brave, Brave Smith had 12 points, and he barely got – he got the, the 12th point toward the end of the game when the game was out of reach. So what they did defensively, they, they reduced Edie's touches. They were very physical with him because you got to remember now, he fouled out, uh, I think it was Johnson. You know, Johnson mm-hmm. came in. He had five fouls in five minutes because what was he doing? Being physical with Edie, keeping him out of the paint. All right? So he they used nine fouls on the center position hmm. against Edie. They right. cut down. Right. They, nine fouls. That's what they used on the, on the, out of the center position now. Some of them forwards got in there and got some fouls too now. But what they wanted Edie to know, they, 
you're going to be in for a long night. You're going to get your, but we finna cut your buddies off. They ain't getting nothing because they were one out of seven from the three. When Purdue is winning basketball games, the three ball opens up the inside for Edie, where Edie mm-hmm. becomes more dominant. But what they did, they made sure that Edie was not getting the ball because most of the time he's the one making the assists. He's the one passing out of the double teams. So mm-hmm. what they did, they tried to make sure instead of a double team, they did what we call digs. They, all they did, as 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 you get close to him, reach in. Keep him from doing the crab grip, dribble. Keep him from getting close to the basket. Reach in, knock it away. Uh, throw off his timing. And it worked for him because he was uh, 15 out of 25 uh, from the floor. And and that's, that's the only way you can play somebody that big. Because that's a huge human being. And I told you all last Saturday, they spent all their time with Edie on one end of the floor doing yeah. exactly what he did in the game now, shooting right-hand hooks, left-hand hooks. So you knew going in that was their game plan because you're not going to waste the entire practice session with this man on the other end of the floor doing those type of things. And, and so the, uh, they saw it just like I saw it. And they were prepared for it. So UConn, when, you, when you're talking about having a uh, balanced score, you know, mm-hmm. they, they counted on more than just one person. They had four people in double digits. They spread basketball around. And I think what was most refreshing, uh, Carlos, was that mm-hmm. you didn't hear Hurley piss and moan about the transfer portal. Right. Or mm-hmm. NIL, mm-hmm. or, you know, the kids, this and the that, and, you know, how spoiled the kids are, that sort of thing. You know, it was strictly pretty much about basketball and getting the kids prepared, you know, and then buying into everything that he was telling them, you know, and them having reached that level of excellence that he expects out of them. And I think, you know, that that's made the game and the situation in itself so much more refreshing, you know, because, I mean, it's, it's you get sick and tired and sick and tired, you know, of hearing, you know, well, this kid's going in the portal and, you know, mm-hmm. this kid wants X amount of NIL money and all that sort of thing. Or, you know, you're hearing the coaches complain about it more so than, than the kids. But, uh, you know, to have it just be about basketball, that that, that was great right there right. in and of itself. Right. And, Will, they could have used, you know, a lot of people don't know this. Their their flight was delayed. They, they didn't get they didn't get to the yeah. final four when they were supposed to. Mm-hmm. But you never heard you never heard Coach Hurley use that or the players mm-hmm. use mm-hmm. that as an excuse. Their schedule was thrown off. They didn't use that. When somebody asked him about it, say, "Well, everybody have travel pro- uh, problems. That's not just us. Everybody does." Mm-hmm. So they didn't. They had no excuses whatsoever. They played team basketball. They ended up shooting 48 percent from the field. They they, they were their three point shooting team. They were six out of twenty two. But their mm-hmm. defense and the fact that they uh, took away the other people and that left Evie on the island by himself. Purdue could not overcome that. And you know, it's interesting. Let me ask you, let me ask everyone on the panel here. Um, Connecticut, have they utilized the transfer uh transfer portal? Or they didn't. And so if that's the case, like you said, old old school is still good school. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right. Well, he's mm-hmm. got people on his roster that have been there. But they, when they go to the portal, mm-hmm. they go for a specific position. They don't, they don't just bring in five or six people now. They, okay. they, they go one or two people out of the portal that will fit what what their uh, immediate needs are, and that's what they've done over the years. Yeah, and, all, plus, all coaches, plus, to me, all coaches are living in the portal. But I think that. And there was an interview that he did about talking about that in terms of what he's looking for coming out of the portal. I think they're a little bit more judicious. They do a little mm-hmm. bit more of their background and their homework on mm-hmm. these kids before they decide that's that they're a good fit for Connecticut basketball. So and I think I think the kids, you're right, Charles, and I think the kids that he's going after 
are kids that he have prior relationships with. Yeah. Yeah. You know, mm. So, you know, he's not going in there just, you know, cold cocking and, you know, drawing shrubs, that sort of thing. You know, he's going into the portal after kids that he's had relationships with, you know, all the while. Maybe he recruited them when they were in high school, that sort of thing. Or he has intricate knowledge of what those kids are about. So he knows whether or not in advance they're going to be good fits for his program or not. And I think that that makes all the difference in the world. And then A.D. Brown, he, he'll mm-hmm. tell you something else. Here where, here's where money comes into play once again. They can afford to get the to do the background checks. They can pay to have background checks done on these kids. A lot of times we, when I say we, HBCUs, mm-hmm. we don't have that luxury. We don't have that luxury. All we can do is go by word of mouth what somebody tells us. But with them, they spend the money. They have the money to spend to actually do the background check. Now, don't get me wrong. There are programs that got money and do the background checks and still find out that that kid is off the court is, is not a good fit, a good person, rather, off the court. But they still bring him in because they're looking at how much that kid can help them win. Mm-hmm. So, so everybody does not use the money the proper way. You know, you can find yeah, other, mm-hmm. Yep. So so that's out there, Carlos. Well, let the me other ask. part of the two Carlos in this case, mm-hmm. and even Coach Hurley said it, you know, he's got a mentor in Jim Calhoun, who is a Hall of Fame coach. Mm-hmm. That when he first got when Coach Hurley first got there, he was overwhelmed. He was completely overwhelmed. The things that he was doing wasn't working. He said this in a recent interview, and he went to Coach Calhoun and said, Coach, it ain't working. And Coach Calhoun said, Get your head out of your you know what and get to work. And I think mm-hmm. that settled him down. I think when you have those type of mentors, when you have somebody right there in the building that can help you, it helps it a little bit. And then, of course, with today's college basketball transfer portal, NIL, and whatever else you know resources they have, they can be a little more patient with that. So I think Coach Calhoun was probably his biggest cheerleader. Like, hey, let's not let's not cut let's not cut out Coach Hurley quite yet. Let's give him some more time. And I think. UConn's administration listens to him because he's a Hall of Famer. He's won. So I think that helps, too. When you have that that family-like, mentor-like situation to slow you down a little bit because fans want to get rid of you after two years or three, whatever, I think that has helped UConn and helped the young coach and Coach Hurley as well. Well, Let me ask this uh, specifically. Is Connecticut losing people out into the portal every year? I would think not. But you tell me, Coach Pettaway. No. Okay. No, no. Well, he, he, yeah. he, no, no. He's not losing his players. Mo- most of his players return. That he retains the kids. And when when they, when a kid leaves for the NBA or they graduate, they try to fill that need with either a player out of the portal. If it's a need that they need right away, gotcha. mm-hmm. so he uses the portal to replenish his roster. But he's not the type you're not going to see seven portal people on his team at one time. Right. He doesn't do that. And and you know we've been talking about the portal, give us and take us away. It's just interesting that he uh, he in Connecticut they're not losing a, a, a lot of players. And then you know we talked about it last. Last week, it just seems to be every year you got to recruit the players back. That's that right. you, so I just find it interesting. They're not having that problem, but you know, if we, if we narrow down into the Southwest Athletic Conference, it, it, it's kind of a different issue. I hear every right. week, you know, losing lo- losing players, and um, Edwin says. <laughs> Get used to it, A.D. Brown. It's a different world now. <laughs> These kids come and go. That, that 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 is true, but I know I said I long for the the, the way it used to be. <laughs> it's not going to be that way. So yeah. who best navigates through this topsy-turvy transfer portal and, and throwing NIL? It's right, but see, it's, it's still new, Carlos. It's still fresh. Uh, people are still learning how to navigate the NIL, 
and the transfer portal. You got both yeah. of these things slapped on you at one time, and people are still trying to find the right niche because it, it, it's crazy. And I want to go back to something Charles said that's very important that a lot of people are missing. Yeah. Hurley had Coach Calhoun to rely on, right? I'm going to tell you mm-hmm. something else. Administration did an outstanding job because Coach Calhoun and Hurley, they are so, their styles of coaching are similar. Mm. They are both the same. They, they drive them hard. They push them hard. And administration had to recognize that after Calhoun left. Well, you, you know, they had, uh, they had one of his former players to come in there first, but they had to get back to the way Calhoun did it. And that's why they brought Hurley in. So a lot of times in the with the administration, they need to look at that. They need to look mm-hmm. at what type of program, they have, what kind of toughness they want in their program. And that should help them decide on the hire. Now, getting back to the portal, the portal has hurt and, and, and the swag. See, the reason why we can't give you a, a real update on what's going on at East Swag School is because of the portal. You don't know who's left these teams. And you really don't find out about it until uh, the preseason thing comes out. You, you you don't know unless you own that campus because a lot of us, a lot of our school, we don't, we're not even releasing that information. We, mm-hmm. You don't, they don't release it until the last minute that a, that a kid is gone. So well, that's they're... just like here. Uh, I'm just fortunate enough to be at a and around a and I, I know that uh, uh, Mara Simmons, she is now at uh, San Jose State. You know, she left mm-hmm. Alabama and them in the SWAC, and she's mm-hmm. already landed. They did a big to do about bringing her in, and and, and it's out there. So the the, the the transfer portal, and hers was strictly just a portal. It had nothing to do with NIL. It's getting close to home, getting closer to home, and and that's the reason why she lost her coach, and so she decided to get go back closer to home. But that's that's by design, design, though. That's by design, though, Coach Petterway. You know, these these schools aren't putting anything out uh, because, number one, they don't want you to know that kids are leaving their particular mm. programs because it looks it looks bad, you know. And, you know, so, you know, nobody's going to really say or do anything until they got all the new pieces in place or they have a plan moving forward in terms of how they're going to rectify the changes that are that are coming down the pipe, you know, it, it's the it's the HBCU mentality, you know, that we keep everything under wraps, you know, we keep it all under the table, you know, until we have figured it all out, you know, and then we spread it all out there for for everybody to see. Well, right. well, I I can't see. Go ahead, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Charles. The one thing I'm learning. There are people that live on these Twitter, these X sites. Social that, media. Yep. Social media. There are social media sites, Carlos, that mm-hmm. reflect the transfer portal. There is a transfer portal site on X in which every player that's hearing the portal, if you know the right people, you can get access to the transfer portal. It requires a password, a username. If you can mm-hmm. get that information from people, from the right people, you can get access to the portal yourself if you want to. So there are people on X that I follow that, and they they go out there that follow basketball or football, and you know it's out there. And so they're gonna put that out there. So that's how I get the information. Of course, being here at Alcorn, I talk to our coaches, and you hear a little scuttlebutt stuff from the streets about who's gonna handle the portal. So you got that, but that stuff is out there, and it's just a matter of of, of whether or not when you know. It's not if you know. It's when you know. So when you know, you're kind of shocked, you're kind of surprised, like, wow, I didn't see that one coming. But it probably was coming down the pipeline all along. It's just when you found out about it, and then it just hits you in the face, like, wow, like Florida A&M. Florida A&M men's basketball, they haven't named a coach as of yet. And so I've seen five or six names in the portal. They don't have a coach as of yet. Hopefully this week they probably, you know, they might name a coach. I don't know. But, you know, when that happens, you know what's going to happen. The players are going to hit the portal because they don't have a coach. The administration tries to keep them like, hold on, we're gonna have a coach, but you know, players gotta look out for their best interests, NIL and other things. So this this is like free agency, man. People are looking out for their own best interests. P- 
people want to go to school and play and exercise their opportunity to play sports and they want to be in the best possible situation. We don't have a coach. Those things can and do happen. I'm glad AM named a coach, Don Brown, fairly quickly, um, but Florida AM has not. And so the byproduct of it is what? Players are going to leave. And now you got a head coach coming in that's starting over from scratch. And that's a tough thing to do, even though the portal's got plenty of players. But the Southwestern Athletic Conference is unforgiving. Teams are getting better, and you got to find a way to hit the ground sprinting and not running. Sure. On right. that on that note, we're overdue for a timeout. Let's take a quick timeout. Our number two, Dr. Paula Jackson, Baton Rouge native. I know Willa. I'm sure you know <laughs> very Dr. well, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Jackson. We're gonna we're gonna talk with her. Uh, uh, women in sports administration. I want to know the rewards of it, how rewarding the challenges. And, you know, we have to take a, a, a look sometimes in the mirror. As far as a lot of women have done a lot of great things in our community, no matter if it's in business and, and in sports. And sometimes I just think they need to, they need to get their just rewards. We need to, we need to thank them and tell them how important of a job that they do. You remember what they say. If you're married, you must <laughs> let that lady know. Don't take it for granted. And I think we've all been guilty of that. I can say that yours truly here has been guilty of that. So, so before I talk about anybody else, I look within. And I say, what can I do better? So with that being said, she'll join us in, in the hour number two. We're going to take a quick time out. Boy, when we come back, we'll wrap up hour number one. You're watching the Coles Brown Show right here on the Black College Sports Network. If you think all pads are exactly the same, think again. This is always Ultra Thins reinvented with the always triple protection system. This pad wicks gush is 90% faster absorbs even more so you can feel dry and locks odors in. Rethink your pad for up to 100% leak-free and odor-free comfort with the totally reinvented Always Ultra Thins. This is always like never before. The Cuvée Group is a Florida-based marketing and training consulting firm. We help businesses communicate to their target audience and engage them in conversation. We also help to expand their audiences, which will ultimately result in growth for those organizations. In addition to being a certified constant contact specialist, my colleagues and I are also certified in John Maxwell Leadership Principles. We use these proven principles to conduct workshops, training, and private coaching sessions for individuals and companies looking to take things to the next level. Contact us to schedule a free consultation. Issues today, don't delay, call Cuvay. As technology continues to bring changes to the world of education, it's time we also reimagine teacher professional development. Gone are the days of one-size-fits-all learning that can only be accessed at a specific time and place. The Stride PD Center is an on-demand library of mobile-friendly courses that allow educators to learn anytime and anywhere. Our dynamic courses provide bite-sized learning and help educators advance their knowledge while also gaining professional development hours. The best professional development plans are those that include a level of flexibility and choice for educators. Whether you're a teacher, school, or district, visit us today to take charge of your learning. Welcome back to this week's edition of the Coles Brown Show right here on the Black College Sports network uh, guys i'm looking in the chat room let me let me pull up two comments uh art bet says uconn does not need to rely on the portal because top rated high school athletes uh will sign with them top rated high school don't sign with hbcus first only when they are not happy at a top program we've seen that we've yeah. seen that and, and also in the chat room um student athletes who make say all swag first team then in in some cases they leave to go to other programs 
I E in football, F B S. I, I think I think that's true. I, I, I really do. At least the comments I agree with of uh, those two comments uh from the chat room. Panel. Yeah, uh, I, I agree that you know that Charles over the last few years, there have been a lot of top of, of all swag basketball players that have moved on. Uh they leave, they 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 uh hey they learn their craft or they hone their craft in the SWAC and then they, they move on to where some of them consider greener pastors, but it doesn't always work out good for them now. Some of the kids mm -hmm. that have left the SWAC, they didn't do so well now in, in, in the other places. The grass was not greener. So you have to take it on a case by case basis, but yes, it's happening. It's happening in all sports in the SWAC. The uh, bigger uh, schools are coming in and taking some of our better, better people. I'm sorry, go ahead. And Carlos, I, I think I think in the SWAC and at the HBCU level period, we're looking at stats. We're not looking at fit. You know, we're not looking to see whether or not a kid actually can fit in fit to who program. we are and what we're doing, that sort of thing. We're looking at pedigree. You know, we're looking at how many stars a kid has behind his name, the fact that he or she was recruited by power five schools and things of that nature. You know, we're grading off of that particular curve as opposed to digging deep, doing our homework and trying to find out, you know, whether a kid can really mesh in with, you know, my coaching style or, you know, the players that I have already in place, that sort of thing. So, you know, we are looking at two different dynamics here yeah mm -hmm. and i think that that makes that makes a difference I, well, I think the other part of it carlos you know even if you just look at swag basketball this past season look at the players that are in the portal that made all conference ken evans player of the year jackson state you you look at your guy joseph southern university one of the top players in the league hitting the portal i mean uh, pj henry last year was in the portal came back so those are three names right there, we, and we can go. I think the guy at UAPB, their their top score, Milton. Um, yeah. I mean, so I mean, I don't know if it's and well, I, I probably do know. It's you know NIL, and you don't know these guys on social media. People are hitting them up. People are in their instant messages. People are DM, DMing mm -hmm. these guys, and so when you when you're getting that information, when people are hitting you up behind the scenes. And somebody can maybe offer you a little more NIL money, more than what you may be getting at a swag school. You're going to take a deep, hard look at it because, again, like free agency, money matters. And so they hit the portal. That's part one. And then, like we talked about last week, there's some cases in which coaches are kind of pushing these kids out the door. And I hate to say it, but it, it's not like in the NFL where you know the relationship between Josh Allen and Stephon Diggs was not the best and the Bills moved on from him. Stefan Diggs, there's no doubt about that. But, you, you know, at the college level, it's kind of softening up a little bit. But there are situations where coaches are kind of pushing these youngsters out and moving on because the portal has better talent out there. You don't hear about it. It's not directly said by these coaches, but that's a part of that aspect too. So you have players trying to move on, get more than what they're getting. And then, in a way, coaches are kind of moving on from them too. Whether it's COVID or you know if they had that COVID year left or not, um, I think you're seeing some of that too. So there's a lot more in the bag when you hear about a player transferring. There's a lot more to that story than you probably think, and I'm learning that just based on what I'm hearing in the streets and from some of our players and others. It's a lot more to the story than we think when these players hit the portal. Even though they're all swag, they did a great job, but then they're in the portal. Why is that, you ask? Is it because they're unhappy? Or is it that maybe an attitude situation where the coach is ready to move on? There's a lot of stuff in the bag there when you're talking about all conference players or top flight players on these teams leaving these programs. Well, we had a coach right here on this show who admitted it. Carlos James, a baseball coach at UAPB, faced with the situation, and he was brutally honest. Taking a kid, a student athlete out of high school, or taking a student athlete out of the portal, he flat out said he's making that choice to get a kid out of the portal. Charles, you should remember that. He he said it, flat out said it. So with that being said, 
because he also said you got to win and you got to win now. And so that is the climate that we're in. Once again, I would love the old school way and mesh it with the new school way. But the case is now you got to win and you got to win now. Some coaches will go that route. We've had Coach Graves come on this show and talk about having a balance, you know, with JUCOs, with student athletes. You, you would like to build a student athlete coming as a freshman and matriculates and gets through in the senior year with a degree in the hand and a better person and a better player. Coach Petaway, you know about that. You oh, you yeah. coached in the time it wasn't like it is now. So uh, from an administrative standpoint, Wheeler, it makes it tough as well. I mean, we know, we know that, we know that, you know, the athletic scholarships are one year renewable. We know that. Yep. You know, and but it behooves all coaches to make sure that they're doing their homework on the front end to ensure that the kids that they're recruiting out of high school or whatever, they're going to be a good fit for their programs. Mm -hmm. I've always frowned on coaches getting rid of kids after one year, especially after the freshman year. Mm -hmm. You know, very few freshmen are going to come in and burn it up, Carlos. You know, so unless they are tearing up the dorm or you know, robbing banks downtown or, you know, <laughs> something to that effect, you know, you need to keep a kid around for a couple of years to, before you can really find out what they're going to bring to the table. Yeah. You know? So, I mean, but, you know, you got to, as coaches, make sure that you do your homework on the front end. You know, when you're recruiting these kids, go into high school, talk to the janitors, talk to the cafeteria ladies, you know, talk to the people who see the other side of these kids on a regular basis and find out who these kids are. You know, because, you know, they're yes, sir, and, and no, sir, you to death, you know, when you're right there sitting in the coach's office, that sort of thing. But to go around the corner and it's MF this or SOB that and, you know, the whole nine yards that go with that, you know, so we got to make sure that we're on top of these things you know, at, a, at an early stage. And that's where recruiting dollars come in. You know, NCAA gives you X amount of uh, visits or times that you can go visit these kids, that sort of thing. Our coaches have to take advantage of all those opportunities. You know, on they really note, and truly do. Uh, excellent points. On that note, we're going to take a quick time out, get ready for – uh, Dr. Paula Jackson has been patiently waiting. We'll take a quick time out. We'll come back with Dr. Paula Jackson, Associate AD for External Relations at Norfolk State. I guess she gets to see uh, Coach Odoms every other day, uh, at least twice a week. <laughs> we'll, be, we'll be back after this quick time out. If you think all positive. Since 2002, Empowerment Resources, Inc., a nonprofit organization, has empowered more than 1,500 youth and adults in Duval and surrounding counties. Through its programs, Journey into Womanhood, Girls Mentoring, Life Skills for Teens, and Parenting Education Coaching. To get involved with programs, volunteer, or donate, visit www.empowermentresourcesinc.org. Follow us on social media, facebook.com forward slash empowerment.resources and instagram.com forward slash empowermentjax. The human voice has always connected audiences with experiences. Major brands all across America have trusted Kevers voice time and time again. Conversational. Powerhouse, intelligent and sincere. That's the voice you need for your creative marketing process. K E A V E R S V O I C E dot com. Kevers Voice, Kevers Voice, Kevers Voice dot com. Always on, all the time. Nope. Nope. You want him? Ooh, I like him. Quick, the quicker picker-upper. 
Bounty picks up messes quicker, and each sheet is two times more absorbent, so you can use less. He's an eight. He's a nine. Bounty, the quicker picker-upper. From novice to aficionado, find yourself here. High-quality cigars plus personal customer service. Slow Burn is Waco's only mobile cigar lounge, featuring a meticulous curated collection of premium cigars. Visit our website, www.slowburnwaco.com. That's www.slowburnwaco.com. Welcome back to this week's edition of the Carlos Brown Show right here on the Black Power Sports Network. Our special guest, Dr. Paula Jackson, um, Associate AD for External Relations at Norfolk State. Uh, Dr. Jackson is a graduate of Southern University woo-hoo, with a bachelor's degree in broadcast and print journalism, <laughs> uh, MBA in marketing from Clark Atlanta University. Also, and we're going to talk to uh, Dr. Jackson about this. Um, founder and CEO of Sports and Focus and Minority Trailblazers in Sports <laughs> Conference. Introducing now Dr. Paula Jackson. There she is. <laughs> Good. Um, af- I'm all right. Good afternoon, right, Dr. Jackson? In uh, on the Eastern Standard Time. How are you? Yes. Hello, happy Saturday. Good to see everybody. Hello, Dr. Hello, Paula. <laughs> well, we're you know glad. <laughs> <laughs> we're glad to have you on the show. Um, simply talking about um, uh, women in sports administration for you. How rewarding has that been uh, for your entire career in sports administration? Um, extremely re- rewarding for me. Um, as you mentioned, I went to Southern University, so you know I grew up on the bluff because I went to Southern Lab as well. So, um, you know, I started traveling the games when I was three years old with my parents. Wow. Yeah. And by the time I was in high school, I knew that whatever I did, I wanted it to revolve around sports. So, you know, walked across the street to get that degree in journalism because I wanted to be a sportscaster. And, um, you know, that was the the initial dream. And then I started asking questions about, um, you know, how does this work? What happens? Who pays for this? What happens before you, you know, you don't just show up and roll out the balls and stuff. So um, that's where the business side, my interest in the business side started. And, um, you know, eventually got into the business. I really had to work. I did a lot of volunteering knocked on a lot of doors because I wasn't a traditional athlete. I was a cheerleader when I was there on the bluff. Um, So, you know, my coach worked in the president's office. I couldn't go ask her to help me get into the sports business. So, you know, I did a lot of, as I said, networking, knocking on doors and started Sports in Focus. Um, Sports in Focus initially was marketing and um, special events around larger uh, major events. I even did some marketing for the Bayou Classic when State Farm was the title sponsor. I worked on the State Farm side. Um, but yeah, finally got my opportunity at Clark Atlanta. Back there, um, they hired their first female athletics director, who ironically came from Southern University, uh, Brenda Edmond. So mm-hmm. gave me my first opportunity to get into the business. And, you know, I've been running with it ever since. I also had an opportunity while I was in Atlanta to, to do um, five seasons with the Falcons on the game day operations staff. So it's been a lifelong dream, um, something that I really worked hard at. And it's a passion for me. I got into it because I love sports, but I stayed in it because I have a passion for my student athletes. I call them my headaches and my heartbeats. Those are my babies. <laughs> you know, it's interesting, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, uh, looking at your bio, uh, you still president serve as co leader of Title IX Circle, also a uh, former member of the board of directors of Minority Opportunities Athletic Association. Um, talk, talk about that, and then it'll kind of lead me into um, 
my next part of the question about challenges. Huh. There have been challenges, um, <laughs> but you know, that's why you have to have a passion for this. I think, mm -hmm. you know, obviously just in life, there are always pa uh, challenges and difficulties that you're going to run into. And when you choose a profession, um, you know, sometimes if it gets too hard, you just get out and choose something else. Mm -hmm. But to really stay in it and fight through it, you have to have a passion for this. And for me, I look at sports and athletics as a way to um, prepare the next generation of leaders. Um, I want them to look at me not just as a sport administrator, but as a mentor. You know, I'm the one that always has an open door. You can come and talk to me about anything. And a lot of the initiatives that I've started were based on those conversations, just student athletes just kind of hanging out in my office. And I said, you know, why don't we expand on these things? So I started um, an initiative called Girl Talk because the female athletes have a, a different struggle than the guys do, especially, mm -hmm. you know, our, our, our African-American female ladies. So we have an I gave them an opportunity they, where they could talk in a safe space. Um, we could talk about anything talking about your program i don't want it to be just a bashing session about you know this is what's wrong this is what we want to change but tell me what's good tell me what we can build on and then outside of that tell me about you as a person um and because of that i get you know birthday cards and mother's day cards and invitations to baby showers and things like that so that lets me know that i'm doing what i'm supposed to be doing I'm making an impact in these young people's lives and just, you know, as I said, using sports as the vehicle to do that. Well, Dr. Jackson, that means that with this uptick in women's sports, the the, uh, the spotlight on women's sports, that means that you got to feel real proud about that. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, we've always said, you know, the ladies work just as hard as the guys. They have, you know, the five o'clock wake up calls, the 530 sessions in the morning they're doing the same things you're just not putting the eyes on them and you know really giving them the respect that they deserve so finally you know we're finally starting to see that and you know i was one you know after the game last week when um south carolina went i was standing in front of the tv you know how you stand up in church with your arms folded and, 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 and i was standing up in front of my tv i was crying with her i was texting my friends i'm like i'm crying i got just played every minute in this game what's going on <laughs> you feeling this i'm like i am this is so phenomenal and it really was you know and for everybody to really join in in that moment and then to see that you know, the women's game actually had bigger numbers than the guys. It's like we're mm -hmm. making history. We are making history and tearing down those bar those uh those barriers. Now, you know, and, and I, I want to turn it just a little bit. And, and those are great things. Barriers, mm -hmm. um, challenges. A woman, African American. It has been a rewarding career for you, but th th those challenges. Talk a little bit about those and do you see those challenges in the future being a little bit lesser? And there are so many opportunities, I would think, but you correct me if I'm wrong if there's not, uh, for women and African-American women in sports administration. Um, well, you're talking about barriers. How long is your show again? Because we can. <laughs> well, 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 you'll put it in a, a cliff note <laughs> Um, You know, but that actually was the title of my dissertation The mm -hmm. Barriers of African American Women Seeking Leadership, leadership positions, positions in College Athletic positions. Administration. That's the correct. First, huh? um, the first chair that I had told me that that was not a viable topic. She didn't understand that she was, you know, she was a white female. She said, I don't understand that. It's not a viable topic. I don't think there's enough research. I said, well, that's why I want to do it. First of all, it's a viable topic because I'm living it every single day. Amen. Um, and I want to do this because I want to add to the dialogue that people are having and to the research. So when people come behind me, there's something that they can refer to. Mm -hmm. I switch chairs. 
<laughs> and you know, find a chair that would, would support me. And she became one of my biggest cheerleaders, but there are, you know, so many barriers. And I talked about this in a conversation with a colleague just earlier this week. Um, African-American women, for the most part, are steered to compliance and academic positions mm. because they're more nurturing positions. You don't see as many women in the business office, in development, and the external areas because we're, we're, we're skewed to those, those other two. Um, even myself, I came into this business through compliance. And, you know, people will say, if you know compliance, you can always find a job, which is true. But when I'm mentoring people, I tell them, if you want to use it to get into the business, that's great. But don't pigeonhole yourself and get stuck there. Ask for different assignments. Ask to do things, you know, outside, step outside your comfort zone. But that's one of the biggest things. Because when you look at opportunities for athletics director positions, they want to know have you done fundraising? Have you worked in external? Have you worked in marketing and ticket sales and all those different areas? And if you say no, they automatically kind of push you aside. It's getting a little bit better now, but particularly for us as Black women. And in doing my research, um, what I found was those nurturing positions go all the way back to you know, slavery times when the Black women were taking care of everybody's babies, not just their own, but you know their white owners, they're taking care of their children. So they are the natural nurturers. And even myself, I love, as I talked to you earlier, I call it my headaches and my heartbeats. I love my relationships with my student athletes. But I also had to understand that if I'm going to move out of compliance, I have to figure out other things for me to do in this industry and ask for those additional assignments because we're always going to be overlooked um, again when doing my research the hiring hierarchies particularly for like senior associate deputy positions that of course ad is your white male your white female black males asian men and women and then african-american women now you know, I did my my uh, research about four or five years ago. It's changed, but it hasn't changed that much. Mm. The perception is starting to change. You're starting to see more women now in these leadership positions. You know, in my conference alone, we have eight schools in the conference. We have five female ADs. We have a female conference commissioner. That's history in and of itself. Mm -hmm. You know, but we're still saying things like first and only when it refers to African-American women. So these are the things that we're, you know, we're trying to get away from. And if, you know, for whatever reason, if somebody makes a misstep, it's magnified. <coughs> the next five, 10 women that come behind them are not gonna get that same opportunity. So mm -hmm. it's not just enough to be, you know, 10 times better than, we almost have to be perfect. We can't make mistakes. You know, we are held to a different standard, even though we aren't given the same opportunities as this, at the same rate as others. Um, so it's ongoing battle. Um, I tell people all the time, make sure that you are staying up on industry, industry trends. Professional development is a must. Make sure that you have not only your inner circle, but make sure that you also have your personal board of directors. You have to have people that can speak for you and speak on your behalf when you're not in the room, um, because those are going to be going to be the people that help you um, in your career. And, you know, we talk about our circle and, and my very small circle is my sister circle. You know, it's, it's all of us black women where we can get together. We can cheer up. I'm still, you know, I said I was a cheerleader at Southern. I am a proverbial cheerleader. I cheer my sisters on to the hill. You know, I'm like this. I'm clapping. Let's go, y'all. Let's go. So we have that. When something doesn't go right, you go to that circle, you crown their shoulders, then you wipe your face, you put on your lipstick, and you back in the game. We have to push ourselves like that. And those that are coming behind us have to be able to see that and we want them to be a part of that as well. You see, I can talk about this all day. 
Uh, well, you know, uh, uh, Doctor Jackson, it's it's important, and sometimes I, I said earlier, sometimes you have to have the conversation, and you have to reflect and look at oneself. Now, at HBCUs, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times you, people try to compare apples and oranges as far as resources. You don't have that. So you're fighting that battle, and then from what you're telling me, there's another battle with within mm -hmm. at HBCUs. Is there an opportunity to uh, change the landscape? Um, you mentioned about in the Mid East Athletic Conference, women leading the athletic department. Mm -hmm. Do you see a way where overall HBCU uh, institutions that we can we, we can do better? Yeah, I think there are definitely opportunities, um, but it's still a mindset thing. You know, there are some people who are just set in that mindset that if you have an athletics program, particularly one that has football, it needs to be a man running it for whatever reason. I mean, we've got women running multi multi-million dollar companies. We've got women running NFL NBA, you know, professional sports, but that mindset is still very, very prevalent. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, it's old school. Uh, we haven't quite figured out how to break through it, but you know that the, it's the people in leadership. We have to get them to understand that we're just as qualified. We can do just as good, sometimes not better, of a job because we bring in a different lens. Um, one of the things that I constantly do, as I said, I'm a major proponent of professional development, but one of the things that I did was start doing professional development outside of sports because I want to be able to look at it in a broader sense and from a different lens. Um, a couple of years ago, I was in the, I was chosen as a fellow for the HBCU Leadership Institute. Mm -hmm. This program was specifically geared towards people um, on the vice president and president track at HBCUs. I thought it was important for me to go through that program because I need to know how they think, whether I am going in as an athletics director or I switch and become a vice president or a president. I need to know how they're thinking so I can interact more. One of the major uh, proponents of that, um, or segments of that program was board governance. How do you deal with the board? How do you interact with the board? Um, mm. So it becomes like another, um, it's a class. You have to figure out how to talk to these people, how to manage up, down, and you know on your same level so that when opportunities are presented to you, you're ready and you step into them and lead and you know, God's grace not make any missteps. Wow. Right. Hey, now Carlos, I'm gonna tell you something now. I see a pattern here because when you did her, uh, Dr. Jackson's bio, she mentioned Clark Atlanta. I knew uh, Tamika Smith, well, she played at A&M, but I think she's married now, Tamika Smith Jones. She came through Clark Atlanta. All right, and I, I, the other thing that I see that's in common is SIAC. A lot of these ladies, are, uh, a lot of the females are getting their start in the SIAC. And Clark Atlanta specifically is doing an outstanding job of putting out, uh, 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 letting administrators come in and and get started, man. And I think that's great. So between Clark Atlanta and the SIAC, there's Nedra Brown. She's now out in California. She was in the SIAC. And then down in Fort Valley, uh, you got Miles. She's down there. So the SIAC is somebody in that conference. The light has come on. And they're allowing these late these women to get this thing started. And I think that's great, Dr. Jackson. Uh, when I heard the clock in Atlanta, that was that was cl close to my heart because Tamika, uh, she played at Alabama a and when I coached Yeah, she, she is a part of my circle. She okay, is a big good. part of my circle. She is one of my, my sisters. That's um, and when I left Clark Atlanta, she took my place. Got you. Yeah, and then she stayed and went on to become AD there as well. But yeah, she is one of my best friends. Um, in and outside of the business. And um, yeah, we've been friends for a long time. So she's at Kennesaw State now as the chief. Right, right. 
chief executive officer. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And That's I will great. say, you know, you mentioned the SIAC. When I was there, uh, Robert Biles, who became commissioner of yep. the, mm -hmm. the track, Robert Biles was commissioner then, and he was the one who introduced me to professional development and got me involved in it. Um, he said, what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis is great, but you need to get out, talk to other people, learn best practices, and network. Those were the, you know, the first time when I started to hear those terms. That was from Robert Biles, and he remains one of my mentors to this day. Right. That's great. Outstanding. Well, you know, Dr. Paula Jackson is a shining star. Yes, the gold and blue. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> hey, Carlos, we're not going to hold that against her. We're not going to hold that against her. <laughs> but, uh, uh, Dr. Jackson, how often do you get a chance to, 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 to come home? And if I'm not mistaken, didn't your son go kind of to, uh, in a similar field? And is he still... In, in there I, I remember he was a he was a little one <laughs> I, I know I, yeah he grew up in this business and um to answer your first question i don't come home as much as i want to y'all know i i am a boo baby i love being at home <laughs> yeah. um so i hopefully i'll um, i'll get an opportunity to, to at least move a little bit closer but you know always there during the holidays if possible i try to come home for a game um i was at the family game last year um, and, you know, sometimes during the, the summer, I'll try and get home, too. Um, but, yeah, uh, Blake, I call Blake my legacy. Um, he is following in my footsteps. And uh, just a couple of weeks ago, he started a new job with USA Football. So I am ah, super proud of him. Congratulations. Because, yeah. you know, uh, sports administrators, and, and, and sometimes I, I've given them a hard time. Uh, uh, like Will, like Will, Will. Uh, being in administration, it, 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 it's it's it, it's tough because the college athletics it's forever changing. Yes, sir. Yeah, and, and so I, I give them credit. Um, everyone is is doing a, a a great job, at least the best that they can, and it's a tough job, is what I'm trying to say, uh, Doctor Jackson. But it seems to be uh, rewarding. Uh, uh, for you um your focus and I, i'll pull it up uh, sports in focus and minority trailblazers and sports conference mm -hmm. that conference is coming up correct yes so it initially was supposed to be in april and we moved it back to july so it's going to be in um july 19th and 20th in atlanta and this year I'm actually partnering with CLC powered by Learfield. So we're gonna be at their, um, their office in Atlanta. Super, super excited about that partnership. Um, and you know, just to give you a little bit of background on the conference I told you about, um, it was difficult for me to get into the business. And I kept mm -hmm. saying, there needs to be somewhere where the people that are trying to get in can um, meet talk, network with the people that are already in the business. And then it just clicked. It said, you plan events, so why don't you plan this? And I called some of my friends that at the time were working in the NFL, and I said, you know, if I plan this, will you come and bring your friends? I sat on my sofa with my laptop and sent out invitations, and lo and behold, people showed up. So, you know, I've been doing it ever since then. Um, it was initially open for students. But now it's open to anyone who wants to get into the business, wants to network with people that are in the business. And even for those that are already in the industry, it's another networking platform. Um, so we have a whole, you know, two days of content, two days of networking. We have a good time. Um, last year was the first year it was in Houston on the College of Texas Southern. So um, the staff there was absolutely phenomenal. Um, uh, we just had a good time. But since I had this partnership with Learfield, I'm bringing it back to Atlanta this year. And um, you know, last year, Taylor Brooks was, a, was our Minority Trailblazer of the Year. Um, so we were happy uh, really to honor her and that she could be a part of everything. So um, all of you are invited. Come bring your show on the road. You can broadcast from the show. Um, it's a good time, and now we're starting to do specific content for coaches as well. 
Um, mm. We just felt like there needed to be a place where we could all get together, um, network, have a good time, commiserate, talk noise, whatever we want to do. Um, that's our place. That's our space to do that. And what are the dates again? Uh, July 19th and 20th. Also, if someone wants to email you or get information, mm -hmm. is there a, a specific place that they can uh, get the information? Yeah, um, they can email me at pljackson at sports in focus and in focus is spelled e n f o c u s dot com. So sports in focus dot com. Um, and yeah, just email me. I'll send you all the information. If any of you would like to come and be on a panel, you know, we can make that happen as well. Well, you know, uh, one of my colleagues on the Black College Sports Network, and I think you know him well, he just said, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Cavill says 2025. <laughs> well, yes. he wants it back at Texas Southern, and uh, maybe I need to get with him about doing the show. Um, he was our speaker that spoke on the um, HBCU and media panel last year. So um, you're welcome to come back. You'll be in Atlanta this year, but come on back. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <sir. laughs> uh, Carlos, I have a right. question. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Jackson, uh, we have a sports administration um, major here at Alcorn. Um, and so for those who are in the program, and I talk to students that are part of the program, it's, you know, it's back and forth. And I think, you know, obviously the commitment, the dedication that's involved to get in the program. What would you tell prospective students uh, to share some advice in terms of staying with it, because it could be a it could be a tough road to get into and a tough road to stay with. What would you share uh, with potential students who are interested in getting into that field of sports administration? Well, the first thing I always say is make sure that you have a passion for it and you're getting into it uh, for the right reasons, not because you want to go to the games and get in free, not because <laughs> you want to be on the sideline and be able to do selfies from the fifty. Um, because it's it's a, um, a industry that will beat you up. You have long nights, you work weekends, you work holidays, you're missing time with family and friends because when they're off watching games, we're the entertainment. We're the ones that they're watching. So make sure that you're getting into it for the right reasons and then figure out what your passion is. You know, for me, it was compliance and academics because I knew First and foremost, that's where we have a lot of issues. So I wanted mm. to be able to get into that and try to help as much as I could. But then, as I said earlier, don't stay there. Step outside of your comfort zone, ask for those hard assignments, um, be the one to say, you know, raise your hand, I'll volunteer for whatever, to get as much experience as you can. Um, I felt like I got into the business late because I worked in corporate America um, I worked at MTV. I was the vice president for an insurance brokerage firm. I started the sport and entertainment division there. So whatever I did, my passion for sports was still showing. So you may have to do other things before you actually get into the business, but keep pushing. All of that um, experience that I learned in corporate America, then I brought it to the sports industry. Um, find you a good mentor. They want to reach out to me. Hey, you have my email address. They can contact me. Um, I try my best to bring up as many behind me as I can, because as I said, I knew how hard it was for me to get in. So I'm trying to help everybody that I can, but they have to stick with it. When, when things get tough, don't just say, well, I've been doing this for you know two or three years. It's not what I expected it to be because it's not. It's not going to be what you expected. Um, it's not going to games and sitting down and enjoying the games. We are, we're working, not saying that you can't have fun because mm -hmm. it is a fun industry, but it's work. It's work and it will beat you up, especially for us. Mm. And bring them to my conference. We have group rates. Uh, we have student groups that come all the time. Um, yeah, reach out to me. We can, we can set that up. Paving the way for future women in sports and black women specifically, but all women in sports administration. Uh, Dr. Jackson, we are 
appreciate the time. We got to get you back and have a follow up uh, uh, session. And uh, it's great, <laughs> great seeing you again. I think the last time I interviewed you, I was doing radio locally. And, and I know, that, see, that yeah. It's like you don't love me no more. You got big and famous. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I'm just a people's champion. I'm a nobody trying to tell everybody okay. about somebody. But on that, <laughs> but on that note, we will stay in touch. I am so proud of you, a Baton Rouge Thank native, you. Southern University and in college. I love it, Charles. Thank you. He was a famous cheerleader, and some people <laughs> were already talking in the um in, in the chat room about you. Um, have a great and blessed weekend, and we will talk to you. I promise. Okay. Again, very I'll soon. Hold you to that. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so much. It was nice seeing everybody, and please stay in touch. Take yes, care, Paula. All righty. On that note, I may have to send her some um, boudin balls. I would say, <laughs> I, would, I, I would say crawfish, but then I know Charles will just light up. I'll have to tell you a story about Charles and his crawfish. Um, we'll, we'll take a quick time out uh swag baseball report richard morgan williams oh alabama state a huge you talked about it earlier huge uh victory midweek game um oh yeah dr jack says i need crawfish too you're absolutely right <laughs> <laughs> and, and i know the company that can ship it to you <laughs> On that note, Richard Morgan Williams up next, and then we'll close out the show. Uh, spring football game uh, should be starting about 20 minutes. We'll be back. You're watching the Carlos Brown Show right here on the Black College Sports Network. We're back. It's time for the 2024 Urban Nerd Con. Join us in Atlanta, Georgia, April 26th through the 28th at the Cortland Grand Hotel. Special guests include Underworld creator Kevin Grievous, Gary Gray from Fairly Odd Parents, from Nickelodeon Giovanni Samuels, the Science Machine Michael Green, the Sci Fi Sisters, and from Spaceballs and Star Trek Voyager Tim Russ. Hi, I'm Tim Russ. Join me April 26th through the 28th at the Cortland Grand Hotel in Atlanta, Georgia, for the Urban Nerd Con. Our heroes. Our villains, our stories, everyone con. I'll see you there. Live long and prosper. Visit theurbannerdcon.net to get your buy one, get one free badges before the price increases. Remember, our heroes, our villains, our stories, everyone's con. See you there. back to this week's edition of the Carlos Brown Show right here on the Black College Sports Network. We're just tuning in. Uh, we visited with Dr. Paula Jackson um, from North Norfolk State. Um, good interview. Guys, It once again, I just have to self-reflect. And um, sometimes, you know, you look at it. I, I rem remember even the Civil Rights Movement, one of the complaints was women were like, where do we fit in? We helped with everything. And in sports administration, there's opportunities uh, for not only women, but African-American males as well. So it, it's, well, um, it, it, uh, Will, was you about to say something? No, I was just, I was just wanted to interject and kind of add to some things. Mm -hmm. You know, we've always been relegated to caretaker positions mm -hmm. you know, as it pertains to athletics. And when I say caretaking 
positions, Carlos, is keeping the student athletes in line. Mm -hmm. So we've always been relegated as African Americans. We've been pushed in those areas first and foremost. Yeah, whether it's compliance, you know, whether it's uh, not necessarily say strength and conditioning, but you know, it's always something with sheep herding the student athlete, making sure that the student athlete is where they need to be, when they need to be, so forth and so on, as opposed to the other items that. Uh, uh, college administrators are looking for when it comes to hiring uh, for athletic directors position, like business folk, like fundraising folk, that sort of thing. So, you know, it's hard for us as black folk to break that mold. And, you know, mm -hmm. as Dr. Jackson was saying, you know, somehow we have to find a way, you know, it's mm -hmm. not just the black female that has been relegated to that. You know, there was a, a long time the black male in athletic administration was relegated to the same thing. And it was always difficult for us as black men to get that same job, you know, simply because our experience was in compliance, our experience was in strength and conditioning, our experience was in athletic equipment, that sort of thing, as opposed to what colleges are looking for in terms of that fundraiser, in terms of that guy that can go uh, to IBM and solicit, you know, funding and, and things of that nature. So, you know, it, it's a thing of the black female now getting the opportunity to really shine and then taking advantage of it, which is great. There's no if, ands, and buts about that. And uh, so, but we've always been relegated, like I said, to the caretaker type positions, that sort of thing. We've always had to try to find a way to fight our way out of that in order to try to get to that, that top seat. And now the onus for us is to be able to not just stay in that top seat, but when you uh, are let go or you're moving, to another place, that sort of thing, being able to make that transition and getting back into that that top seat again. If that it makes sounds, sense, what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it sounds like um, there should be more conversations had and and togetherness. And specifically at HBCUs, we can do better, and we will. Mm -hmm. On that note. We'll switch gears a little bit and uh, now add another person, Richard Morgan Williams. Uh, he'll be talking of some swag baseball. And I, look, I, I pulled it out. Charles, Grambling State and Southern University in Clement Weather. They, they're starting their series today, but there were some uh, interesting games uh, in the conference uh, last night. So, We'll, we'll just wait on uh, Morgan for a second here. And that, there he goes, Richard and Morgan. Hello. <laughs> How's everybody doing today? All right. Good. All right. Good. 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 good to join you guys again. Uh, well, we, we appreciate it. Let's get right into it. A big game in a midweek game. And, and, you know, a lot of times it's like, oh, it's just a midweek game. But I think for HBCUs, those midweek games are important. Alabama State over Auburn University, three to two. Well, uh, it, to not sound like a broken record, I told you last weekend uh, that it can be done. It is. Mm -hmm. I'm not shocked. Uh, looking at the development of Alabama State's program, heck, over the last twenty years, uh, this does not shock me. Not the first time they've gone on the field and competed with Auburn and uh, with other big uh, universities. So. Uh, when I saw that that final score, I said congratulations to that team in Montgomery. Uh, got a couple phone calls. I told them I'm very proud of them for what they did. Uh, one of my friends said, you should wear an Alabama State hat uh, on the show this weekend. I said, that's never going to happen. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> that will never happen, but I, but I am still uh, still proud of Alabama State. Uh, was a three to two game. They went into the seventh inning down one to nothing. Seven, eighth, and ninth, they were able to uh, put runs on the board and hold on for a three to two victory. So um, I know one of the conversations we had uh, last weekend was the state of pitching in the HBCUs. Uh, mm-hmm. Alabama State was uh, able to to put that to the test against a pretty powerful uh, SEC opponent. So um, LSU one week, uh, Alabama, Auburn, and who knows what else the SWAC can do. Uh, we have the ability, and I'll continue to get on here and say those exact same comments. Uh, I am not shocked. Well, I think yeah. it's going to happen three weeks in a row. All corn goes to Mississippi State Tuesday at 6 o'clock. I'm going for a three in a row. Whoa! Hey, yes, sir. <laughs> hey, if that happens, and by the way, speaking of that, uh, Charles, I got a chance to hear uh, a pregame talk with Coach Williams, and basically one of the things you guys were talking about, he wants a pitching coach. And, Charles, I'll be honest, I was shocked. Wheeler, I mm. was shocked. Administrator, make it happen, Wheeler, if you were there. Definitely. Make it happen. Definitely. Definitely. Coach, coach Petaway, that's like having your right-hand man uh, on your staff not there. Wow. I, I, I was shocked. I'm just going to be brutally honest, Charles. Um, and, and Coach Williams being very transparent. It, it it makes a difference. So that's the question put before you. It may be a silly question to ask, but how important – no, I don't even want to say how important it is to have a pitching coach. You got to have it, right, guys? You, yeah. you, you That's a, a must. Mm-hmm. Well, and that's the state of a lot of uh, universities. And this, again, and I want to point out, it is not just our institutions that have these issues. Uh, many times you'll see that pitching coaches will be GAs at a lot of schools, graduate assistants who stick around and are able to fill those positions, which are unpaid. So uh, that, that becomes a bigger issue for baseball, which is not a revenue generating sport in many places, uh, being able to get that type of assistance for the head guys. So that is is very important to get someone that knows what they're doing in that position that can work and develop uh, pitching, but is not always there. And uh, that could be at our school. That could be at uh, smaller universities like uh, University of North Alabama or anywhere. Uh, they do not have the ability to bring in graduate assistants. They can't always afford it. Here, here's wow. what we've had in the past. I'll just share a little history in terms of, what we've had in the past. But what we do is we'll hire or we'll get someone who's baseball savvy, who has an education degree that can teach classes. And they are they will double up and you can call it whatever you want to call it, but they'll double up as a pitching coach. They're paid, they're on salary, they have benefits, they're a teacher. But they also spend time on the baseball field as a pitching coach. And that's what we've had in the past. I think some other schools are probably doing the same thing. So to get them in the door, as far as working, they're a teacher. And they work with their boss, their dean um, of that school to kind of get them to go out on the baseball field and work there too. So that's kind of what we've had in the past. Now, can that change? Yes. Will that change? We'll see. But I think at a lot, at a number of schools, I think that's kind of what's happening. You kind of double up as a professor. You spend time in the classroom, you teach your classes, but then you're able to go out on the baseball field and, and make it happen there. So in terms of hiring a pitching coach that is just, quote, unquote, a pitching coach and nothing else, if if our schools, Jackson State, Bethune, FAMU, if they have that ability financially to do it, they can. But I know at some of our schools, you've got teachers who have baseball knowledge, who play baseball, have an education background, are qualified to teach also are working on the baseball field. And I think it's one of the more difficult positions to coach, if I'm not mistaken. You know, not a whole lot of guys really know what to do on that mound, you know, in terms of in the intricacies of coaching the, the pitcher position. You know, so, you know, on top of the financial challenge, Finding somebody that's uniquely qualified 
you know, for that particular area has got to be kind of difficult also. So if you get a good one, you got to try to hold on to them because I think somebody's going to come after them, you know, just just as, as fast as they can. The reality uh, with uh, pitching coaches that you also have to understand is that out of every uh, skill group on the baseball team, that is the uh, year-round uh, development phase. So if you start working on your pitchers uh, in the spring or before the season starts, you're behind the eight ball. There needs to be throwing programs throughout the, the winter, uh, throughout the summer, actually, that's able to develop arms and arm strengths. Because I've seen once you, you start in the spring, if that's your, your ramp up, that's where you start seeing the shoulder and arm injuries. So these... No, I mean, I, I, I guess I'm just I'm perplexed. I'm frustrated because I'm a reference back to Coach Williams in the interview with Charles. He mentioned the Jackson State of Southern and the Grambling having those pitching coaches, and, and that is important. I, I, I don't mean to be critical and turn my nose up to it, but to me, that would be in all ways, if you can find, and it sounds like it's from a financial standpoint, to find that money. I bet you I could find some extra money. <laughs> uh, I'll cut I'll cut some of the fat in some of that budget. No, actually. Uh, but, 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 but seriously, yeah, five minutes remaining. That Richard, that is so important. And in all cases, that's a must. And, um, you know, I, I sympathize with the plight of some of the schools that don't have that, but oh my goodness, baseball, the one, the sport that they talk about all the time that can make some noise in postseason, you got to find that money some kind of way. Hey, I know, I know we're running out of time, but let me beat the drum again because and being selfish for baseball, I'll put it to you like this. If Alabama State uh, during the fall went on the Jordan hair and defeated the Auburn Tigers in football, we'd be in the uproar. Yeah, mm. if we're able to do that on the baseball field, and we have proven that we can do this regularly, uh, I would hope and I wish that HBCUs would promote and uh, funnel more money into our baseball programs because we have the ability to compete. Well said. Well said. It's been talked about on this show, multiple shows. Uh, Charles, I guess I, I just was shocked. I mean, sometimes you have to just sit back and and realize, wow, yeah. the things that they're asking coaches to do a lot of times, it's 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 tough. It's tough. And then not only a pitching coach, you're talking about a hitting coach. That's a whole mm -hmm. nother, that's a whole nother deal. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a full time position as well. I, I just think in my own opinion, and I'm on the inside looking in, I think we kind of determine that HBCU baseball on paper, and it is, it's a non revenue sport. And so, therefore, you don't have to put – this is my opinion. You don't have to put as much into it like softball and the other non-revenues. So we, we have to field it because in order to be D1, we have to have these sports. And so you do what you can to do it at a fundamental level for some. Some are a little bit more elaborate, I think, at Alabama State and at Jackson State. And it's a little bit more that they're putting into it. But I think we're doing just enough uh, to field it. And if we win a championship, get the attention – and then the coach yells from the hills, then I think a little bit more will be put into it at that point, i.e. Omar Johnson, i.e. Bob Brady, mm -hmm. i.e. Roger Kador, and others that are getting more once they get on that platform. So I, I just think that's just where it is with baseball until we put more money into it. As Richard mentioned, I think it's going to continue to be that type of struggle for some of our schools, not all. I got about three minutes left. Um, great point. It's another discussion point. Uh, Wheeler, the sports administrator, you have to save the world. You have to make <laughs> you have to make gold out of straw at sometimes. <laughs> but but we'll, we'll 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 come back to that next week. Um, Richard, any scores in the conference that kind of uh, should be given some attention. I mean, I'm looking at some of the scores here, but uh, Grambling State, oh, your top three teams in the conference. My top three teams now, um, 
On the east side, I, I always believe in Jackson State. They're in third place currently, uh, seven to five in the conference, but twenty-two and ten overall. Uh, from an offensive standpoint, I think they're probably number one or number two uh, strongest programs that we have. Uh, so, I come tournament time in the swag, I would see them being a hard out. Uh, number two would be BCU, which is nine and three, seventeen and sixteen overall. Uh, I really believe in um, Bethune Cookman. Uh, I've always found them to be strong, and I'm impressed with their program more so. And I know this going. I know I made a couple people mad last week more so than FAMU. Uh, head to head, Bethune and Fam. I'm taking Bethune Cookman. Uh, and on uh, the uh, west side, uh, go ahead. No, I'm saying ahead. on the on the west side, I'm uh, leaning towards Southern and Gremlin as my top two teams. Overall, who's the best team? Got two minutes. Uh, no, one minute left. We got to move quickly. Overall, number one. Overall, team. in my opinion, I'm going Jackson State. Wow, Richard, we'll talk about that one. <laughs> Next <laughs> week, you're, you're the expert. Want to thank uh, all of our guests, Dr. Paula Jackson, Charles, Coach Petaway Wheeler, producing today's show. Amela and of course uh, Richard Williams. Make sure you tune in next Saturday at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time for another edition of the Carlos Brown Show right here on the Black College Sports Network. Until next time, as always, peace and God bless. Richard, Richard. Richard. <laughs>